We're going to look at it, have a series, and it's going to be the road to Calvary. Now, it's going to be a really quick summary. Uh, part of me was tempted just to start in the first chapter of the book of Matthew, and by next Easter, we'd be, we'd be in, in our proper place. But we're going to be a, a short summary of the ministry of Jesus Christ and as his path and his, his mission to come and to make atonement for our sins, to go to the cross, to die for you and for me. And so we're, it's going to be um, worth coming and just to set our minds on Jesus and what he's done. And for those of us who are here regularly, we know that Jesus is more than just foundational to our faith, as faith, as if he is only the foundation, because really he's the object of our faith. He's a sustainer of our faith, and we could go on, and, and Jesus is rightly the reason that we are called Christians, because without Jesus Christ, there is no Christianity, there is no hope, and there's no reason for us to meet together on a Sunday morning, because we would still be lost in our sins. And so, because Jesus' salvation, we're going to get a look at this the next few weeks on the path to Calvary. But today we're going to start even before the Gospels in a sense, although we'll be um, relying heavily on the Gospels in the Bible, is we're going to look at the beginning and say, who is Jesus and why did he come? And so for a lot of you, this may be a review, but it's, it's worth contemplating over and over about why Jesus has come. But before I started this morning, I uh, found this video here. It's on dotquestions.org, and we're going to let them just answer some of the bullet points, and then we'll jump in the rest of the morning with the sermon on who is Jesus. So, this is it. That... The video summary you just saw is basically a short encapsulation of probably everything we're going to talk about the rest of today. But now you have a uh, primer, and so as we go back to some of these verses, what we do want to see and, and start with asking is, who, who is Jesus and why did he come? Why did Jesus come? And we want, we want to look at this because it is um, pivotal for understanding of faith and who we are today. Well, who is Jesus? As we just saw, the Bible clearly states that the man Jesus was, in fact, the eternal God, having become flesh and entered his own creation. And one of the verses that was just referenced was 1 John. And we look at 1 John, I mean, not 1 John, John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3, which does state that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Um, and so we see this right away, that, that Jesus Christ is God. We have to go in Philippians chapter 2. Once again, I know that, that reference is wrong. This is just so you have your Bibles. You can circle how many times they put the wrong reference up. But uh, Philippians chapter 2, it says, Having this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. So here we say, have the attitude of Christ Jesus, who was in the form of God, that is, who is by form was God, then he took on the nature of a human being. And, and so we see that it does confirm again in the letters in the Bible. And in the book of Colossians that Paul writes, we see that for by him, he's speaking about Jesus Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And when you stop and, you stop and consider the weight of that argument, it says that Jesus is not just divine or just holy, but rather he is the creator. He's the creator of the universe. And if we go back to the very first, first words in the entire Bible, who created the heavens and the earth? But that was God. This is a direct claim to deity of who Jesus is, and not just deity. But when we think of Jesus, do you stop and think that he's the one who put the stars in their place? He is the one who was the acting agent of creation to speak the planets. And the same one would later on enter his own creation. So, because Jesus Christ is, is the creator, and he became a man, and limiting the use of his attributes, taking on the real qualities of flesh and blood, being born of Mary. Another verse we just read was John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. 
the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, Jesus Christ didn't just appear to be a man. He didn't just masquerade. It wasn't like a costume party, but rather he, he humbled himself. He lowered himself. He condescended and said, I'm going to enter that which I made to save the people that I created because I love them. I will become one of them. And he didn't give up his, God, his godness, his godhood, his deity, but rather he limited it and lived as a man, even to the point where he would suffer and die. Um, some people have thought had problems with this all, all throughout history. People in other religions, people who don't have a religion, saying, I, I just can't believe that Jesus was God. I just can't believe that God would become a man. It seems too crazy, too good to be true, too preposterous. And, and I read the story that I found, um, not this Christmas Eve, actually the Christmas Eve before. It's just an example, um, an illustration of what Jesus did. And I thought it would be appropriate to read it again, because it does at least illustrate why Jesus did what he did and how Jesus did what he did. And it says there was a man who didn't believe in God, and he didn't hesitate to let others know how he felt about religion and religious holidays. His wife, however, did believe, and she raised their children also to have faith in God and Jesus, despite his disparaging comments. One snowy eve, his wife was taking their children to a service in the farm community in which they lived. They were to talk about Jesus' birth. She asked him to come, but he refused. That story is nonsense, he said. Why would God lower himself to come to earth as a man? That's ridiculous. So she and the children left, and he stayed home. A while later, the wind grew strong, and the snow turned into a blizzard. As a man looked out the window, all he saw was a blinding snowstorm. He sat down to relax before the fire for the evening. Then he heard a loud thump. Something had hit the window. He looked out but couldn't see more than a few feet. When the snow let up a little, he ventured outside to see what could have been beating on his window. In the field near his house, he saw a flock of wild geese. Apparently, they had been flying south for the winter when they got caught in the snowstorm and they couldn't go on. They were lost and stranded on his farm with no food or shelter. They just flapped their wings and flew around in low circles, blindly and aimlessly. A couple of them had flown into its window, his window, it seemed. The man felt sorry for these geese and wanted to help them. The barn would be a great place for them to stay, he thought. It's warm and it's safe. Surely they could spend the night and wait out the storm. So he walked over to the barn and opened the doors wide and waited, watched and waited, hoping they would notice the barn and go inside. But the geese just fluttered around aimlessly and didn't seem to notice the barn or to realize what it could mean for them. The man tried to get their attention, but that just seemed to scare them, and they moved further away. He went into the house and came with some bread, broke it up, and made a breadcrumb trail leading them to the barn. They still didn't catch on. Now he was getting frustrated. He got up and tried to shoo them toward the barn, but they only got more scared and scattered in every direction except toward the barn. Nothing he did could get them to the barn, where they would be warm and safe. Why don't they follow me, he exclaimed. Can't they see this is the only place where they can survive the storm? He thought for a moment and realized that they wouldn't follow a human. If only I were a goose, then I could save them, he said out loud. Then he had an idea. He went into the barn, got one of his own geese, and carried it in his arms as he circled around behind the flock of wild geese. He then released it. His goose flew through the flock and straight into the barn. And one by one, the other geese followed it to safety. He stood silently for a moment as the words he had spoken a few minutes earlier replayed in his mind. If only I were a goose, then I could save them. And then he thought about what he had said to his wife earlier. Why would God want to be like us? That's ridiculous. Suddenly, it all made sense. That is what God had done. We were like geese, blind, lost, perishing. God had his son become like us so he could show us the way and so he could save us. The winds and the blinding snow died down. His soul became quiet and he pondered this wonderful thought. Suddenly he understood why Christ had come. Years of doubt and disbelief vanished with a passing storm. He fell to his knees in the snow and he prayed his first prayer. Now, it was clearly Jesus is more than an example or just a guide that he had to come to save us. But when people say there's no way Jesus would become a man if he was the Almighty God, they miss the love 
that he had for his creation. And that he was willing to do what it took to redeem us. And so we see that Jesus is, in fact, the eternal God. And we read in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, In the fullness of time, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. It's, it's an amazing thought if you really stop to ponder it. If you think too much, it will hurt your head. Because whenever you try to contemplate eternity and the enormity of God and His majesty, um, it's beyond our scope of understanding. But what we see is the Word, the eternal Word, the same Word that we see in the first words of the Gospel of John, the one who spoke the universe into existence, the one who was God, the second person of the Godhead, that divine mystery that we call the Trinity. And he became the man Jesus to save us. That is who Jesus was and who Jesus is. And so we get to the next question is, okay, if Jesus is in fact God, why did he come? Well, we've already hinted about this and it's not a big secret, but let's go back and break this down step by step. Why did Jesus come? Well, he came, if, well, first, actually, let's backtrack. Before we understand why he came, let's look at his character. What is God's only character? What is Jesus' character? He came, we have already said, because he loved the people he created. And we can look at the many verses in the Bible, and this could take all day, so we'll just take a select few. We're going to put up verses that show us God's love. We read in Jeremiah 31.3, as God is speaking to the Jewish people, a people who are obstinate and hard-headed, and in this context, receiving judgment, that he is still professing how much he loves them. And that he has not given up on them. And that they have a future. And he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God is saying, I have an everlasting love. Oh, people sing about everlasting loves, love. You can hear that on the radio. Um, and it's a song lyrics. But only God truly has a capacity to love with an eternal scope. And that is his heart and his character. Ephesians chapter four, uh, chapter two, verses four through five says, "But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love, with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive, alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved." And we see that salvation is an outworking of God's great love. And again. And we have known and we have believed that the love of God, believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. See, it is, it's a crucial component of God's character is his love. And time and time again, we'll see it stated that God is love. And it's why he came. See, the same, the same loving create, creator in eternity past it was because of his love that he made us. We read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created you and me so that he could have a special relationship with human beings. Yes, he created all the beasts of the field and all the stars in the skies. But he created, when he created humankind, it was the pinnacle of his creation. You may look in the mirror and say, time to time, doubt God's creation and say, well, I don't know about God being the master architect because I, I'm not seeing it. And that may be how you talk about yourself or maybe how your body feels in, that, in a world that now we're trapped with sin and bondage. But that's not how God sees you because what God created you for was a relationship. For somebody to have a special bond with. Later in the Bible, when we even read some verses, he speaks to us in family terms, as children. And he created human beings in his privileged, privileged role. And he did. He came to save us from, from the beginning because we were created by him and for him. And to know him and to be known by him. And his heart for human beings has not changed. Human beings have rebelled and gone their own way, which we're about to get into. But God's heart for humanity remains the same, that he is a God of love. 
And just because mankind has messed things up does not mean that God's intent for us, His heart for us, has been altered. And so Jesus Christ came to bring about divine restoration. And we need to consider that. See, the problem in the Bible, by the way, this problem between human beings and God is what the Bible calls sin. Now, there's a lot of ways to describe sin, and none really perhaps fully encapsulates what it is that sin, but we can talk about sin as impurity, and we have before. And when we compare, like, if I gave you a clean glass of water, you might drink it. If I gave you water filled with jardia, I hope you would not. Right? You, you would not be doing well. It doesn't matter if you can't see it. It doesn't matter if it looks mostly good. Impurities will poison us, will kill us. And that's what sin does to our human spirit. Um, we can talk about sin as just evil. Now, most people don't like to be called evil. We like to at least pretend we're good, or at least somewhere more towards the middle. But the Bible does say that sin is, in fact, evil. And whether it's full-blown evil in our lives, or whether it's just the seeds of evil... It, it is. It's evil. It's counter to God's goodness and God's love and God's holy character. It certainly is disobedience. And in, in many respects, the Bible talks about sin as disobedience. And we all disobey God. It's how we know we're sinners. You hold up the Ten Commandments and it's not a big secret that we haven't kept all ten of them. And like I always use as my fallback example, that one in there about obeying your parents gets us all. You can't claim, well, I was just a juvenile offender. You're, we're still guilty. The Bible also said, talks about sin as rebellion, and that's one of my, in my own mind, when I talk about it, I do. I think of sin as treason, because that is what it was. When, he, when he in the garden, when man had a willful choice of whether to follow God or to believe the lie and become like God in his own mind, determining what is right or wrong, following his own choice, he chose. He chose sin. He chose rebellion. Saying, I do not want to bow to the king. I would rather be the king of my own domain. And in a legal sense, that is treason. And because of our willful and sinful choice to become corrupt and rebellious, people are guilty and broken. And it's the same guilt and brokenness that we see all around us in the world. That we see in our own hearts, that we see in our own families, that we see in our own nation and definitely in the world. The choice we made was a bad choice. Instead of being in love and in order and in right relationship, in a pristine world, we have chosen to try and be our own gods, our own rulers, in a broken and dying and corrupt world. And the Bible says this. We see in Romans 3.23, for all of sin have fallen short of the glory of God. Is a verse that many of you know. And that's the saying, it's not just that there's sin in the world, it's that all of us have sinned. We recognize that it's a broken, sinful world, but we all partake in the same sin. Which is a problem because the wages of sin is death. But here, in Romans 6 23 is such a, an interesting verse because it puts the two bookends right there. It says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, even though we have made a path and made a choice for sin, Jesus came because his heart was still that we may have eternal life in relationship with our loving creator that Jesus Christ accomplished. And, and we think about that. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And I love that word, reconciliation, to be reconciled. And you can think of a family that is divided, coming back together and finding healing. And in this sense, we were, we were more than just divided or having a disagreement. But we were guilty, we were separated, we were lost. We were sinners. But Jesus Christ came. He came to reconcile us and to restore us where there had previously been only guilt and separation. Now, part of this reconciliation, before we just dive to the, the ultimate focus of it, is that God is once again revealing himself to a world that had forgotten him, misconstrued him, and lost, and he's calling his lost children home, the ones who have rebelled against him. So part of that, he's, he needs to inform us again, because as people wandered off on their own path, they came up with all sorts of perverse notions about God, some closer to reality and some much further from reality. 
And they definitely indulged in all sorts of behaviors that were contrary to God's wisdom and contrary to decency. And he started to say, I'm here to reveal God to you. And in many ways, Jesus Christ reveals himself. It's like a lighthouse in the storm with that bright beacon saying, watch out for the dangers. And it's also like the parent calling their children home when they're off playing. I don't know about you guys. When, when we grew up, kids didn't have cell phones. You know, right? It was kind of, you came home when the streetlights came on. Streetlights come on, it's time to go home. And my mom also had the loudest whistle. She'd put her fingers in her mouth, and I, we could hear that thing a mile away. We lived in a little more suburban rural area with woods, and you just like, oh, it's mom's whistle. We've got to come home. And we run home. And Jesus is calling people back to a right relationship with him, but also to a right understanding of him and of life. And I was looking around and borrowing on other scholars and people of reasons that Jesus came. Now, the, the one is, of course, he came to save us from our sins, and we will get to that in just a second. But I also want to understand he came for even more than that. He came to reveal the will of the Father. Many people have guesses about God, and people still do that. Well, I don't know if you can understand what God really is. I don't know if we can know what God really wants. And if we were left to our own devices, that would probably be true. However, God, in his infinite mercy and wisdom and love for us, has said, I have revealed myself to you. I have sent prophets. I pres I worked through the nation of Israel, flawed though they were, to give you my revelation so that you could know who I am. But Jesus Christ was the most complete revelation to reveal who God was. And we read in Matthew 11, chapter 27, verse 27, that all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And we see that God is revealing himself, and most clearly in Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, there's times where it's just really hard to have a proper concept of who God might be. How do you relate to an eternal spirit? When you see Jesus Christ, when Jesus says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. All of a sudden, that abstract truth has been translated into something we can comprehend. Jesus Christ came to preach the good news of the kingdom. He came as a preacher proclaiming truth. And he said, we read in, um, which verse is that? In Luke chapter 4, verse 43, he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also. That is why I was sent. He came to destroy the devil's works. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, He who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to, to destroy the devil's works. He came to give life. In John 10, verse 10, it says, The thief comes only to seek and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life, and they may have it to the full. And if you skip down to verse 20, it gets even better. Because he says, I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. He, uh, he proclaimed freedom for believers. He took away sin. He called sinners. Again, what we're going to focus on here is that what Jesus really did that makes all this possible because it wasn't just to know about God. It was to be reunited with God that he was going to take care of the sin problem. And we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, that he, that is Jesus Christ, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of His Son, of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. <coughs> See, really, our biggest problem wasn't an information problem about God, it was a sin problem. We needed the information that God gave us. We needed Christ's other good works. But we couldn't enjoy any of the other aspects of why Christ came unless we were in right relationship with God. God. And Jesus Christ came to remove that obstacle. He came to take away our sins, the guilt of our sins, by bearing them in His Son. And we, and we know from the Bible that Jesus Christ conquered sin on the cross. And that's what we're looking to is now in this series. We're going to look at His, his path to Calvary, His path to the cross. That God Himself he didn't just enter this world out of love to give us directions. He didn't just enter this world because he was a great moral teacher. He didn't give us proper instruction or a better understanding of who he was. But he came 
to pay for our guilt, to remove the barrier, and to remove the judgment. And the way he did that was by taking the punishment that you and I deserved. By going to the cross, a righteous man, a pure man, would fulfill all of the obligations of the law, who had no sin or no deceit, being an acceptable substitute. And on top of that, being God, being of infinite worth, being willing to bear the punishment and the sin of all mankind. You know, when we, look at, when we look at Jesus on that cross, we need to realize we are seeing God. And it is communicated as we can understand. We see His power, His love, His holiness. And we see the lengths that He went to save sinners. To reconcile us to Himself. You know, that's why He came. He came because that very relationship that He had for human beings in the beginning have that eternal relationship even though we had wandered, even though we had rebelled, even though now we were left judged he came to give us that second chance to make that way where there was no way to bring us back home the Bible says that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and in Christ's own words in Luke 19.10 says for the son of man has come to seek to save that which is lost. One of the verses that was in that video we read just a, or heard just a minute ago was John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We can't know God without Jesus. We can't come to God without Jesus. And there is great, great joy in what Christ has done because in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, we read that he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. And my hope is that most of you here this morning already understand this, and this is a story pressure course. But if you have any doubt of who Jesus is and that you, in fact, belong to God, if you were have questions in your head, if I stood before a holy God, would I be accepted? Would I be accepted? Would I be all right if today was my last day? If those questions ring in your mind, then we need to look to the words of John chapter 3, verse 36, where Christ says, Christ's word is saying, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. See, if we have the Son, we have life. We don't have to live in hope, in quiet desperation, wondering if you're good enough, doing enough good works. But rather you can have the confidence that Christ has indeed paid for your sins. That's why he came. It's um, and if you don't know that, I would encourage you to receive God's gift. We need to confess our sins and say, God, I am a sinner. I know I need saved. And that I want to be reconciled to you. And I know that your word says because of what Jesus Christ has done. Because he died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I believe that. Because of that alone. I will be right with you. And I know we're not even done with our sermon yet. But if you are not confident in that. Then just some quietness of where you're sitting. I would, I would encourage you to at this moment. Take the opportunity to pray and say. Dear Lord. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I choose to turn from my rebellion and accept your offer of forgiveness and restoration. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that he rose again. Please accept me as your child and help me to live for you. And in Jesus' name, I pray this. Amen. If you pray something like that, and the words are not important, it's not a magic prayer, but rather it's the true, true expression of your heart. And the Bible, as we just read, says, He who has a son has life. Then your sins have been washed away. And you've been made new. And you, in eternity, will be able to enter into the relationship which you were created for in the first place. What a beautiful gift God has given. Why did He come? He came to restore us, to reclaim us, to make us His own. To make us so much better than we are. 
And eternity still has not revealed all the mysteries of the goodness and love of God that we'll get to participate in. But Jesus Christ has come to bring him to himself. Now, for the rest of you here, you're like, okay, Pastor, we've got to hear the gospel again, which is great news, and it's a great refresher and a great reminder. So why do we spend so much time here? Well, part of the reason is because we are going to keep preaching the gospel until you have the same confidence to proclaim the gospel as I have had this morning. Because it's all of our job to share this, the wonderful news of what Jesus Christ has done. Some of your friends don't like me. They certainly don't know me, and why would they ever trust me? I, I had that when I was a youth pastor all the time. Some kid would invite their, their student, you know, in high school group, to a youth group, and they're kind of interested in spiritual things. I want to invite them tonight. And then after the thing was over, they'd walk their friend up and say, hey, Troy, this is my friend, and you can insert the name, and we'll call him Bill. This is my friend, Bill. Um, could, I just want you to introduce him. Can you share Christ with them? And I'm looking at him, and all of a sudden, the kid has already got eyes, like about saucers, right? Like, why are you taking me to your youth pastor now? Who I don't know. I feel like I'm going to the principal's office. I feel really uncomfortable. And I start talking, and you can just see checked out. And I'm like, and I want to say to these kids, and we've worked really hard to try and communicate for them to be able to share their faith. Say, they came with you. They like you. They trust you. I don't have that relationship yet. I would love to, and I certainly love to share the gospel. But you understand, even maybe in your faltering, unsure ways of proclaiming Christ, that you'll probably do a better job than me because you've already established trust and built a relationship. So we're going to keep preaching the gospel until you can say, oh, no, we're on point six, sub point A, so that you can proclaim it just as boldly, because that's what we're all called to do. In fact, the Bible says that we are his witnesses. It doesn't say the pastors will be the witnesses. It doesn't say that the deacons will be the witnesses, or even the evangelists. Those who are uniquely gifted for proclaiming God's word, but it says you, everyone, all of us shall be his witnesses. And so I, I hope that in your heart that you are passionate about learning these verses and these concepts over and over again, about pouring yourself into the Bible so that we can proclaim this is why Jesus has come. There should never be a, a reason where someone asks us, what did Jesus come for anyway, where we have to pause and wonder why he came. We should be the most convinced and excited and say, if you really want to hear this, you might want to give him a little warning. You should be so excited. Okay, if you really want to hear this, I'm kind of I'm naturally excited about this. But if you really listen, I think you'll understand why. So if you got a few minutes, I would love to tell you about Jesus Christ. Let him know. It's about to come. But then we can tell him exactly who Jesus is and why he's come and the love that he has and the sacrifice that he made because of the hope that he's given. So, uh, Jesus came. He created us for a relationship with himself. And he came to restore that relationship. And he came to save us. And for that end, he was willing to die. Now, we don't serve a dead Lord. He rose again powerfully. But we're going to look at the road to Calvary, where he accomplished that in that singular moment with a love that goes infinitely in both directions all around the story. And so the rest, of the, the rest of this series, we are going to look at Christ's life and his ministry. Um, but today we want to talk about why he came. And of course, this thought will permeate the rest of it. But I want you to remember, he didn't come just to accomplish it. He came to make relationships where there was enmity. He came to make a family where there were just dead men. And he came to save us and to draw us to himself, both you and me. So uh, we'll wrap this up now, and I just hope that you continue with us as we look at God's word, because there's really nothing greater that we can talk about than Jesus Christ, God himself, his love for us, what he has done for us, and the greatness of his being. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that when we were lost in our sins, when there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. When there was no hope. That you were willing to humble yourself. To enter your own creation. And to bear our guilt. And to pay our price. And thank you Lord that you, you rose triumphantly over death and over sin. And that you are the risen one. And that you are calling men for yourself. 
and the relationship they were created to have in the first place. God, I do pray that we would, we would continue to respond. We know that your salvation is a perfect work, but we are works in progress, and we pray with your own Holy Spirit that you would be molding us more into your image, that we may have the ability to tell others of what you have done, and that we might live in a way that's consistent with how you created us, and in a way that might bring honor to your name. And we say this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.